You've no doubt heard that you're only as good as the company you keep. And let's just say today's speaker, Ken Chenault, keeps some pretty good company. Last year, Fortune Magazine named him one of the world's greatest leaders, a list that includes the Pope, German Chancellor Merkel, Warren Buffett, Bill Clinton, and Bono. This is a guy who knows how to lead, and not just in the good times, but in times of crisis as well. On 9-11, when the World Trade Center went up, Amex's offers were collateral damage next door. Ken kept things going without missing a beat. And when the financial crisis hit in 08, Amex emerged stronger than ever, a resounding tribute to his acumen. He's always been proactive, and in 2010, Ahead of any of his competitors, he initiated digital transformation at Amex, famously stating that American Express wants to be the company that puts American Express out of business. I had the opportunity to meet Ken back in the 80s when he was an upcoming VP at American Express. Now, either the powers to be there had a perverse sense of humor, or they were just trying to test his mettle in making restaurants one of his responsibilities. You see, restaurateurs are a notoriously challenging bunch, and I cannot imagine it was a fun assignment, but obviously Ken passed with flying colors. Now, there's no question that Ken is smart, and I've never, frankly, met a, another CEO that has both a grasp and relish for analytics that this man has. Yet that's not what distinguishes him to me what anyone else, frankly, that knows him. Ken is a relationship guy. He stays in touch. He always makes himself available. Now, he knows periodically I'll get in touch with him, and I'm going to plead for lower rates, and he's always going to humor me before graciously saying no. <laughs> and several years ago, I was reading a profile on him where he talked about introducing this new black card made out of titanium, called Centurion. It was automatically being sent to certain pre-qualified members and some of his friends. I see Robert Kraft nodding his head. Uh, anyway, apparently I wasn't on the list. So I, I dropped Ken a note simply asking if I qualified. Within 24 hours, one was delivered to my office. No note. None was needed. Clearly, I was an exception. And this is how you say, it was a gentleman's courtesy. <laughs> uh, a year ago, some of you may recall, we had a tragedy in one of our restaurants involving carbon monoxide poisoning. Ken was one of the first people to reach out to me to see how we were doing. And was there anything that he or American Express could do? Ken is someone who gets it and someone who cares. Please welcome me in joining Ken Chenault, leader of what Fortune Magazine calls one of the top 10 most admired companies in the world. Ken? Well, thank you, Roger, for those very warm words. As you can tell, Roger and I go a long way back, and he's been an absolutely terrific business partner and a good friend. And he always gives it to you straight, but he's also someone that you can bank on his commitment fully. So you've just been terrific, Roger, through the years. It really is a pleasure for me to join all of you today and it is an honor to be asked to speak at the Boston College CEO Club and the Carroll School of Management. I'm also glad to see so many friends and business partners. You make me feel very much at home. When I accepted this speaking invitation several months ago, the choice of topic was left up to me. So I opted to rely on a tried and true principle of speech making. Stick with what you know. So given that I work for American Express, I've spent a lot of time over the years 
learning and thinking about brands. What defines a brand? What strengthens it? What damages it? How does a brand shape a company's culture? American Express is a brand-driven services company. So I received my first formal lessons on brands when I joined the company 34 years ago. Over that time, I've learned about the relevance of brands to consumers. And I've also learned that the concept of brands is not limited to products. For example, universities have brands, organizations have brands, people have brands. So I start this afternoon with a belief that brand concepts can and do have a direct relevance to many people here today. Everyone here is a consumer. So you're confronted with and take actions on brands on a daily basis. You may not be aware of it or think you're consciously guided by it, but brands are almost always informing your choices. A real brand represents a connection, a rational and emotional connection between a company, its products, and its customer. Now, just to clarify, a brand is more than just a logo. A logo is a design you use in advertising or on promotional materials. A brand, however, is a cluster of values, a cluster of values essentially agreed upon by a company and its customers and clients. From the consumer's perspective, a brand creates an expectation. From the company's perspective, it creates a promise. The strongest brands, the ones that resonate most with consumers, are those that stand for something, that have personal meaning for a consumer, and that reflect a commitment consistently fulfilled over time. In the case of American Express, we've been fulfilling that promise for 165 years, from our time as a freight company, to a travel company, to the global payments, commerce, and services company we are today. Our founders, Henry Wells, William Fargo, and John Butterfield, established the company's values and commitment. A commitment to integrity, a commitment to customers. For a freight forwarding company in 1850, this was essential. American Express was entrusted with customers' assets. We were paid to move them safely from point A to point B. And so from our very founding, the business practice was established that if or when something unfortunate happened to our customers' shipments, be it error, accident, or armed bandits, American Express would make good on the loss, period. This commitment dictated our earliest business practices and established our reputation as a company that could be trusted to do the right thing. It led to our reputation for service and for being an advocate for our customers and clients. When you take a step back and think about it, it actually seems a little surprising that the behaviors needed to run a freight company in 1850 actually established the attributes of a payments commerce services brand that is very relevant in 2015. But that is how strong brands are built. They are built steadily through day-to-day -day actions. They are built by consistently meeting a customer's expectation. Now, you may notice what I didn't include on this list. I didn't say that brands are built by advertising. People are made aware of a brand through advertising. People set expectations about brands 
through advertising. But brand value is really only built by actual performance of the product, by the delivery of the service, by the ultimate experience of the customer. Successful companies such as Starbucks, Amazon, or Twitter are great examples. They generally don't do broad scale advertising, but they have strong brands built through customer experience. Advertising may get people to try our products, but it is the day-to-day -day commitment and service performance of our frontline people that establishes and builds the loyalty of our customers. Because another important point about our brand, or any brand for that matter, is to remember that a brand is not what I as CEO believe it to be. A brand is what the customer believes it is. The power in, th in, in this relationship rests in their hands, not mine. Customers ultimately define brands. For example, Ritz Carlton is a brand that is all about service. They advertise it, promote it, they've incorporated it into their culture. But if a customer walks into the Ritz and has a bad experience, then for that individual, the Ritz brand has just been redefined. If customer expectations aren't met over time, if customer experiences aren't satisfying, then a brand is weakened. But if you have a strong brand, customers will oftentimes give you the benefit of the doubt. They'll give your brand some breathing room and give you another chance. Now I have to tell you, this is a lesson we learned the hard way at American Express in the late 80s and 90s. Leading up to this period, our brand had gained a reputation as being prestigious, elitist, and expensive. And for years, we reveled in those attributes. We took our prestige so seriously that as a company, we too became elitist and arrogant. Should we change our pay in full feature just because some customers wanted the flexibility to revolve their balance and pay over time? No way. Allow our card to be accepted at places customers wanted to spend, like gas stations or supermarkets or discount stores? Please. <laughs> Establishments like that were beneath us. Give someone a reward for using our product. They should feel privileged <laughs> to have our card in the first place. After all, we were American Express. We were so proud of what the company stood for that we tried to protect it by freezing in time. We assumed a brand name, particularly our brand name, mattered more than the product itself. But we were wrong. Our customers' expectations had changed. They wanted value, not just image. They wanted flexibility and relevance, not just prestige. We forgot who was in charge. And as a result, we almost missed the boat. But because of their historical relationship with our brand, our customers gave us time. They kept us afloat as we recovered, as we improved our products, expanded our merchant base, and provided more choice. And we ultimately found that instead of being damaged by all of this, our brand actually strengthened. It remains a premium brand, an aspirational brand, but it's now viewed as less elitist. In fact, it is now viewed as more welcoming and inclusive. It is relevant to more people and therefore more valuable. Over the years, we've learned not to take our brand for granted. We've learned that it has flexibility and depth, 
but only if we listen to our customers because they are the ones who ultimately control it. Because of the importance of our brand, we've made it an essential part of every action we take, including our digital transformation, which is currently well underway. For example, our brand has helped position us at a, as a leader in online spend because consumers trust us to protect their privacy and to provide security. The brand has also been essential in the many business partnerships we've built over the years with leading digital players, such as Facebook, Twitter, Uber, Airbnb, and Apple. Companies, including American Express, invest in their brands on a daily basis. But the ultimate returns are difficult to know. There are tangible returns, such as stock price, but there are also intangible returns. For example, I believe we attract more talented people to our company and have greater customer loyalty because of our brand. It's a difficult measurement problem. But each year, Interbrand, a brand consulting firm, tries to solve it. They do an assessment of brands based on factors such as the financial performance of branded products, the role the brand plays in a customer's choice of product or service relative to other factors such as price, convenience, etc. And they also measure the ability of a brand to retain customer loyalty. For 2014, they ranked Apple as the most valuable brand in the world with a dollar value of almost $119 billion. The top 20 as you might expect, includes a roster of well-known names such as Google, Coca-Cola, Samsung, Mercedes. In 2014, American Express ranked 23rd on the list with a brand value of almost $20 billion. Now to put this in perspective, this would say that our brand represents nearly one-fourth of our total market cap of approximately $84 billion. Now you can debate the interbrand methodology. But it's clear to me that well-managed brands do have significant financial value and generate superior returns. At American Express, we saw one of the clearest examples of this during the height of the financial crisis. At the time of the financial crisis in 2008, our company was largely dependent on the wholesale funding market for our liquidity. When those markets essentially shut down, we had to come up with other options, one of which was to start taking deposits. So within a matter of weeks and months, from a standing start with almost no marketing, we began providing certificates of deposit and savings accounts online and through third-party brokers. Now, some analysts dismissed this idea. Some said it's the height of the financial crisis. There's a loss of confidence in financial services companies. And you're going to ask people to give them your money. But within three months of launch, we had gathered almost $15 billion from consumers. And five years later, we now have almost $40 billion on our balance sheet. This clearly showed the depth of our brand and the level of trust that people had in the American Express name. In the midst of this crisis, with distrust for financial institutions rampant, consumers trusted us. They trusted our brand. The emotional connection people have with our brand is a huge competitive advantage for us. But as I said, that emotional connection must also have a rational justification. It takes time to establish this connection. But it's what ultimately separates a logo from a brand. Protecting this value is one of my primary responsibilities as CEO. Because even robust brands can be destroyed by poor judgment. 
So I want our people at every level of our company to feel that they are stewards of the brand with personal accountability of their own. Now, while this may sound like too lofty of an aspiration, in fact, many of our people have taken up the challenge. Because there is a strong understanding of our brand across our employee base, we're able to have a principle-based management process rather than a rules-based process. Here's an example of what I mean. We all recall the end of 2004 when news broke out about the tragedy of the Asian tsunami. Given our global footprint, rather than wait for calls to come in from customers and merchants, our people went to work. Our service professionals gathered lists of thousands of card members and merchants in the region and placed calls to see if they needed help. In many cases, they didn't, but in some cases, they did. Our frontline employees then did everything they could to provide that help, booking airline flights, approving payments, replacing cards. They also helped where they could with non-American Express customers. And to show you how firmly our service ethic is embedded across the organization, I'll also share this with you. The thousands of actions taken on behalf of our customers did not require a single phone call or email from me. Our service ethic is so much a part of our company culture that our people did not need specific direction. They took those actions on their own because service is one of the core values of our brand and our company. All of these actions, one customer at a time, contribute to what Warren Buffett has called the strong share of mind of the American Express brand. Our name is meaningful to people. When people hear our name, they think about trust, security, and service. They don't just think about our product. They feel something about the brand. This is true not just of us, but of any strong brand. Coca-Cola makes, makes you think about refreshment. Disney makes you think about family entertainment. And yes, Bob, the New England Patriots make you think about Super Bowl champions. <laughs> At our company, our brand is not just an element of our business equation. It is embedded in our culture. On the day they join, our people learn about our history, about the attributes of our brand, about what the company stands for, and they're told of their responsibility for upholding our brand promise. Now, one reason I'm so protective of the American Express brand is because it stands not only for our products and services, but for the very reputation of the company. In the service business, your brand becomes your corporate identity. And in the service business, your reputation truly is everything. You're not offering a tangible product like a car. You're offering a promise to make good on a service. And as with any promise, this implies trust. Now, we are obviously not perfect. We make mistakes, and we've made some big ones. But we've also built a strong foundation of trust with our customers and clients. I've laid out two aspirations for our people. I've told them I want American Express to be one of the most financially successful companies in the world, regardless of industry. And I've set out specific objectives to make this happen. But I've also told them I want us to be one of the most respected and admired companies. Having financial success is not enough. How you achieve that success is just as important. It has to be done honorably. It has to be done through the fair and just treatment of our people. It has to be done with consideration to our social 
responsibilities as a company. As I constantly remind my colleagues, our job is to make deposits in the brand bank, never withdrawals. Now, I said in my opening that brands have relevance to everyone here today. Now, you might have thought I meant that brands were relevant to you as consumers, but that is only part of the story. As I said earlier, organizations have brands, political candidates have brands, but perhaps most importantly, we each have an individual brand. The difference is that while companies take conscious actions to create their brands, individuals tend to develop their brands unconsciously. It happens over time as their words and actions ultimately shape the perceptions and views formed about them. For individuals, it usually starts with the superficial characterizations we all face growing up. People get labeled as an athlete or a smart kid, a geek, a nerd. Over time, however, those levels, those labels fade. And by the time we enter the real world, usually after college, our values and our individuality have been solidified. And our personal brand, the expectation people have of us, develops. I spend time each year talking to students, and I tell them whether they like it or not, their personal brand is being shaped every day. People are forming judgments about them every day. My advice is that it's better to be aware of this than to just let it happen. That way you can take conscious action based on how you want your brand to be judged. Now sometimes they'll push back and say they don't want the pressure of building an individual brand. Or you'll hear professional athletes or celebrities talk about how they don't want to be role models. They just want to play their games or make their movies. But it's clear they've forgotten an important brand principle. The CEO of a company or you as an individual can take actions to shape your brand, but you don't control how it is viewed. That right belongs to the customer. It's the customer who weighs a person's behavior over time. It's the customer who chooses what, if anything, a brand stands for. What, if anything, a person stands for. In the case of individuals, that customer can be your teammates, your colleagues, fans, or voters. They choose who their role models will be. They select their leaders. They choose if someone's individual brand is a brand they will follow. My father never studied brands, but one of the principles he taught me is quite relevant to this topic. He told me when I was growing up that you cannot control other people's perceptions of you, but you can and do control your own actions. Actions that can, over time, alter those perceptions. And he might have added, actions that, over time, can and do shape your personal brand. Thank you. Thank you. So I think as Roger said, I'm open for any questions uh, on any subjects or comments, and so people should feel free. Yes, all the way in the back table. Uh, there's a microphone coming. <clears throat> Hi, wonderful speech. I'm a great fan of American Express. I was happy that you put the chip on your credit card, the only one that did. <laughs> but I'm also, uh, I can't explain it. I have three American Express cards. I don't know why, but I do. Keep them and spend on them. But you know, <laughs> of course, there's always a but. And the but is I'm forced to carry a MasterCard because there are so many places that will not take American Express. And their complaint is that you're more expensive than all the others. So maybe you can address that a little bit. I can, I can absolutely. As you imagine, I address it almost every minute of my life. <laughs> um, 
the reality is that the cost differential has come down substantially. And in fact, with the pricing schemes that are used by the networks, Visa, MasterCard, et cetera, there are some Visa and MasterCards that are actually higher priced than our cards to the merchant. One of the key things that we've done is increase the relevance of our card products. And so what we've done is we have come out with a range of charge cards, revolving credit products, small business, corporate, all to in fact increase the relevance of the products. The second thing we've done is to put in initiatives that have had a real impact on expanding our merchant acceptance. And over the last two or three years, we've launched a range of programs. The most recent is a program called OpBlue, which is geared to small merchants, where in fact we have the companies that acquire merchants for MasterCard and Visa also acquire merchants for us. So it's a one-stop shop for the small merchant. And what we've seen is a very good increase. Uh, and we believe over the next several years, both in the U.S. and a number of markets around the world, you'll see substantial progress uh, relative to our merchant acceptance. And what's critical is that you've got to, in fact, not provide the merchants not just with attractive value. And one of the things we're able to demonstrate is that our average spend on our cards are three to four times that of Visa and MasterCard. For large merchants, we're able to take the time to explain what the value proposition is. For small merchants, that's been more challenging. So what we figured out was a, a low-cost channel working with the same providers that provide acceptance for Visa and MasterCard also are now doing that for Amex with small merchants. And we're having very, very good success. So hopefully, you'll be able to drop two or three of those other cards. <laughs> Yes. Uh, what is the impact on your brand of the fact that you're losing certain exclusive relationships with companies like American Airlines, and there goes the access to their lounges in airports, and Costco? And what are you doing, and what can you do to retain customer loyalty that comes not just to American Express, but to those with whom you're co-branding? So let me uh, balance that. The first one is with respect to American Airlines, we, we don't have a co-brand card with them. That's really with Citi. Uh, the airline uh, we ended the relationship with was JetBlue. Uh, and I'll talk about Costco in a second. But what we also were able to do is we have re-signed uh, every other major co-brand relationship, whether that was with Delta, Starwood, British Airways, Cathay Pacific. Here's the issue, fundamentally, that I believe in strongly, that we offer differentiated products and services. So we had a 16-year relationship with Costco. Reality is that was a very, very long-term relationship. And what we offered Costco at the time was we said, we can actually improve your warehouse club memberships, and we can actually improve the retention. What we also felt is I decided that I wanted to renegotiate early all of our major co-brand deals. Because I don't believe in life what you do is wait for things to happen. You want to be on your front foot. So I wanted visibility into our partner relationships. So we went out early to everyone. We went out to Delta, we went out to Starwood, we went out to British Airways, we went out to a range of co-brand partners. And as I said, we successfully signed all of them. But what's fortunate for us is on Costco, 70% of the spend is outside of Costco. The spending inside Costco is in fact less profitable. So while at the end of the day, I value our partnerships. Here's what I don't value. I don't like to get into deals where I don't think they are sustainable as far as the economics are concerned. And I've never been afraid to say, I don't like to lose money. And so that was not a good economic deal for us. It was a long-term deal. I don't believe you enter long-term deals unless you think that you've got a partner that's aligned with your values, aligned with the brand, and things are gonna move forward. Uh, Costco has said 
that they wanted a credit utility. I'm not a utility. Uh, we provide value. I think that we are very proud of the business results that we generated for Costco. Uh, but I think it's very, very important to have aligned partnerships and relationships. And I think it's why American Express has been one of the most successful companies relative to our co-brand relationships. We work with over 150 banks uh, who issue American Express branded cards all over the world. That's worked out very well with us. But very importantly, 70% of our spending in general is on our proprietary card products. So I have a range of products where, in fact, I can get better returns. And so that's the reason why. Uh, my view is we're on the front foot. Uh, we didn't want to wait until the contract expired. And that, frankly, gives us a significant period of time uh, to operate. And uh, I'm very confident uh, that we're going to do well. Yes, let me pick someone over the side here. Uh, and I think there was someone back here. All right. Good. <laughs> do you, and if so, how do you take this brand um, uh, identity or brand uh, awareness into your hiring process, evaluating whether a candidate is the right candidate for you? That's question number two. Number one, number one. Number two, why not chip in, in that? Uh, here's, here's the point. The reality is, number one, uh, we do, in fact, incorporate the brand attributes into our hiring process. In fact, uh, we have a set of leadership attributes that we think are very aligned with what our brand stands for. And in our performance appraisals, uh, we have incorporated there. And what's critical, uh, very frankly, we've always been known as a service company. But I also believe that you constantly have to reinvent yourself. And one of the things I did around 10 years ago, I took one of our best general managers, and I said, you're now going to be in charge of customer service. And he said, Ken, what are you telling me? Are you telling me that this is the end of my career? I said, no, this is the beginning of a great career. And he has done incredibly well. He's very happy. He's done a great job for us. But he revamped a number of our customer service practices. One of the things that he did was, he said, we've got to hire more people who actually have great attitudes about service, who love service. And there's a way that you can actually test for that. There's a way you can interview for that. So I think you've got to make sure that all of your business processes, the behaviors, are aligned against your brand if you are, are going to be successful. Now, the reality is um, uh, the uh, chip is happening. It's going to take some time. Uh, and it really is just getting acceptance both on the part of the card companies who are moving forward on it and all the merchants. Um, but what I would also tell you is that fraud is all over the place. And at the end of the day, it's not going to protect you just from, from online spend. Uh, so the reality is you've got to make sure that you are focused on what you need to do with fraud. Now, one other point I would make is that American Express has a major advantage because we have an integrated payments platform. Unlike any other, Visa processes payments. Good company, doing well. But the reality is what I think in the digital transformation, integrated platforms are going to be important. So our fraud rates are 50% lower than Visa and MasterCard's fraud rates and all the bank's fraud rates. And that's because of the integrated platform. So we're going to continue to push forward on technology. Uh, and I think you'll see more advancements, not just by us, but the industry overall. Yes, there was someone here, and then we'll go back. Yeah. Can you speak a little bit about Small Business Saturday and how that plays into the elitist view that you're trying to get away from, if that was part of it? Yeah, I think uh, Small Business Saturday, uh, for those of you who don't know about it, has been a tremendous program for us. And what I'm most proud of is that we came up with this idea uh, in 2010, uh, really coming out of the financial crisis. And people said, you know, the last thing we should do is make an investment uh, in a program. And someone came up with the idea two months before Thanksgiving. So we said, how are we going to implement this? And people really rallied. And so what this is about 
is to educate people and make them aware that if you want to support your neighborhoods, if you want to, ha in fact, create jobs, that small businesses have created two-thirds of the net new jobs in the United States, you can, in fact, support small businesses. And so this turned into a viral campaign uh, where we not only did broad-scale advertising, but we actually had small merchants on their own create offers and promote it. And it's frankly the only thing that we've been able to get both major political parties to support. Uh, so we had the president, we had uh, Boehner out shopping on Small Business Saturday. Uh, but it has uh, really taken off and the awareness level has now increased around 60% of the people are aware of Small Business Saturday. Now another important point we made and I think this is critical when you think about different types of programs you put in place. I decided that the hero was going to be small business. And what we said was, we don't care what card you use. Doesn't matter. Just support small business. Now, the reality is that consumers, I think that struck a chord with people based on our research. And what we saw was disproportionate spending took place on our card. But people also liked the fact that we were saying, if you're gonna use cash, checks, MasterCard, Visa, Discover, doesn't matter. This is important for this country to support small business and to support job creation. And so we are thrilled that this has really become a movement and what also has happened is we've brought, in other, we've brought other companies under the tent to support small business, so it's not just us. Uh, so we have made sure to share the credit and just to say we're the founding sponsor, but we've gotten a range of companies uh, involved in this. And this is not big business against small business. It's big business supporting small business. And it's having our economy and our overall ecosystem working together. Yes. One last, question. One last question over here. If you can just stand up and the microphone is coming. Can I enjoy, hello, is it on? Oh, I enjoy your remarks and you know, MX is a great company and it's funny, whenever my wife thinks there's a mistake in the statement, there isn't. So um, <laughs> you guys always win, but it's great. Well, I'm, I'm gonna try to keep you in Good stead. Believe me. Uh, yeah. for, for certainly your entire marriage yeah. on that score. <laughs> well, I want to get taken something. A few years ago, I read a study that Bain and Company did, and I was thinking about your comments about the customer experience creates the brand and so forth and so on, and your brand promise. Bain did a study, and 80% of the CEOs out there, of uh, I think 300 companies, believe they delivered a superior customer experience. They then went to the customers of these companies only 8% right. of the customers agreed it was such a great experience. Ken, what's your take? Why the disconnect? Why is it the C-suite executives are so far removed from the street level of intimately knowing who the customer is in? Because that's a huge gap, 80 to 8%. Well, I think the reality is that in a number of companies, there is not an understanding and frankly a belief in the impact of customer service on the bottom line. Uh, and at the end of the day, what I would say to people is, if you want to check out someone's beliefs as a CEO, follow the numbers, what they invest in, doesn't matter what they say, what they invest in will tell you what their priorities are. And the reality is that what people will say is, I just can't see the return, I can't measure it. Well, the reality is, and Bain's done a lot of work in this area and, some very, and did some very good work for us in this area, uh, the reality is, that you can measure it. And that if you focus on the net promoter score, recommend to a friend religiously, you will see a very strong correlation on not just loyalty, but engagement. And so very frankly, when someone says to me, my customer satisfaction is high, that CEO could be getting reports that frankly may show the satisfaction is high, but really don't focus on is there engagement with the customer and is it resulting in an outcome? And so what is interesting to me, I mean, we had this issue ourselves 20 years ago. Someone would bring in a report and say, 
my customer service scores are very good. And I'd say, well, if your customer service scores are so good, how come we don't have more charge volume here? How come you haven't increased the share of wallet of this customer in this segment if your satisfaction is so great? Obviously, it's not. And so what it takes is the CEO, the top management team, the senior team to make sure that customer service becomes core to what the company is doing. You measure it. You compensate people. In our compensation scheme, 50 percent of our incentive compensation is based on shareholder value. 25 percent is based on customer engagement, and we have very, very tough measurements and scores. And 25 percent is based on employee engagement, because we believe in the service profit chain. If you don't have highly motivated employees who are focused on the right things, focused on providing customer service, you will not generate long-term sustainable shareholder value. So if you have someone who has a short-term perspective of I just want to demonstrate a bottom line a year or two, look, if you've got half a brain, anyone can do that for two or three years. The question is doing it over 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 years, that's the real test of a company. Uh, and that's where the focus has to be. So thank you very much.